So Dr. Kidder is here to, to share a message. Dr. Uh, Pastor Kidder is from the seminary. He's been there 15 years at Andrews. I, he was there when I was a student, and I really appreciated his class and his uh, spiritual uh, mentorship. We would walk around, and so when I came here to Grass Valley, I said, I, I called him up, I think within the first two weeks, and I said, Pastor Kidder, you've got to come to my church. And so uh, you were coming last year, but there there were some complications. You couldn't come, and so we're glad that you're here this year. Uh, he's been pastor for 20 years at seminary for 15, has uh, two adult children, a son and a daughter. And so I just want to thank you for coming, and we're looking forward to it. My wife was uh, reading in the Bible, and she came across a phrase that says, David was seeking after God's heart. And that phrase intrigued her, especially the word that he was seeking. Uh, so we decided to study in the scripture about all of the people who are seeking after God. And we found about 500 of them in the scripture. Uh, I was very surprised there are so many people who were seeking after God. But tonight, I have to add you to that list. Uh, so the number could go up to six or seven hundred here because you decided to be here. You could have been at home or in bed by now, but uh, you wanted to receive a blessing from God. And I know that God is going to bless you. If you are wondering about my accent, I come from Nineveh. You don't see a lot of people from Nineveh. But tonight, it is really your chance to see somebody from Nineveh. I am the product of Jonah. So if you have any doubt about Jonah, just look at me. And all doubts will be removed. I grew up approximately 10 kilometers, 6 miles from the grave of Jonah. Unfortunately... For thousands of years, the grave of Jonah stood in the city of Nineveh, reminding people of all ages to repent and to turn to the Almighty God. But unfortunately, last July, ISIS destroyed it. They bombed it. You could see the video on YouTube, and it's no longer in existence. There were about 235,000 Christians in the city of Nineveh. Does anybody know the, me, the, the name of the modern city? Mosul. Mosul is on one side of the Tigris River, and Nineveh is on the other side. But Mosul became so big that it encompassed both. 235,000 Christians, but in June 11, 2014 they were given the option of either converting to Islam or die or leave the city. All of them, except for nine, left the city, which should serve as encouragement to all of us to stay faithful to God. I uh, grew up in uh, Nineveh, and then my father moved the family to Baghdad. And that's where I found Jesus. One day, my cousin and I were roaming on the streets of Baghdad to explore this new city. And by divine providence, we came to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I come from a country of 35 million people. That's just about as many people that live in the state of California. But in the whole country, we only have one church. And approximately, at the time when I was there, about 170 people who attended that church. And when um, I became an Adventist, I was kicked out of my home. I was beaten almost to death. And I was abandoned by my family. And I lost a scholarship that covered four years of education. And I lost two years of schooling. That happened... 38 years ago, 
But seven years ago, I discovered I am alive because of what happened at that day. And the Lord gave me wonderful gifts I never expected. One of them happened last year. But you have to come back tomorrow to hear the rest of the story. And please bring a friend with you, especially that this issue of the Middle East and ISIS is so hot on the news. So come back tomorrow. But tonight I'm going to tell you how prayer changed my life and the life of one of the churches that I pastored. I'd like you to open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 21. There is a story that is repeated four times in the Scripture. Very few stories are repeated four times, but this is one of them. By the way, you want me to be up there? You could see me better, or here is okay? It was a mixed uh, response. Okay. Go with me to Matthew chapter 21. One day, Jesus went into the temple, and his spirit was grieved. Because he saw the place was turned into a business area. So he made a whip. And he kicked the money changers out of that place. And then go with me to verse 13. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer. What amazing to me is that Jesus does not say, my house shall be called a house of preaching. And we do a lot of preaching in the house of the Lord. But he doesn't say that. He does not say, my house shall be called a house of singing. Or a house of fellowship or evangelism or ministry. He says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Because nothing in the Christian life will ever happen without connection with our Heavenly Father. That's what I have been praying about. I woke up about uh, 3.30 in the morning, which will be 1.30 your time, went to the airport, and I really prayed that we all will be men and women of prayer, and that our connection with God will be deep and meaningful, and that it will last the rest of our lives. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I just pray that you will speak through me, that you will give me the words to say, that you will put power and effectiveness in them. Lord, people have come with different expectations, with different ideas, different needs. But ultimately, the greatest need we have is to have more of you. So, Lord, give us more of Jesus and help us to be like Enoch, who walked with you. I just pray that we will walk with you that we will develop that wonderful friendship with you. Thank you, Lord, for giving us that privilege. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. In 1970, approximately 60,000 evangelical scholars, pastors, writers from all over the world came to the city of Chicago to discuss how to revive the church today. It was at that time when this country started to become secular, when postmodernism came into this world, and the church started to kind of lose its grip on society. The people came with all kind of plans and ideas and strategies and techniques But I'd like you to listen to what the keynote speaker said. 
He said, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. Now think about it. If there is no Holy Spirit in this church, and I will show up next Sabbath, will I be able to tell the difference? Now I pray I will be able to. I pray that everything will collapse. Nothing will happen if there is no Holy Spirit. And if I have the ability to look into your heart, will I be able to tell the difference? Are we operating the church like a club with some spiritual emphasis or the extension of the body of Christ in the world? The Southern Baptists did a study to identify the top 10 problems that the church is facing today. They said number one problem is apathy. Would you agree with them? I I would say anyone who goes to church will tell you that's one of the major problems we face. Lack of commitment, lack of zeal for God, uh, shallowness, superficiality, no depth, worldliness. One of the people who participated in this study wrote a book called Confronting Casual Christianity. He said, most Christians have one foot in the kingdom of God and the other foot in the kingdom of this world. And they love it that way because they want to get benefits out of both worlds. Um, Teenage dropout, fear of evangelism, maxed out schedule with no real purpose or result. Did you know that we never have lived in a time of history that we have so many books on how to have a healthy marriage. And there are more marriages in trouble than ever before. We have tons of books on how to raise your kids the right way. And more of our kids are in trouble. We have tons of books on how to grow the church. And it is harder than ever before. It's not that we are lacking the knowledge. We are lacking the power. And that's what we need today, the power of God. Um, Did you know that it cost the Southern Baptist $385,000 to come up with this list? I could have done this research for half of the price. You don't need to do a research to come up with a list like this. Anyone who goes to church on a regular basis will tell you these are the problems that we face. I looked at this list and I said, what is causing it? These are symptoms. What is the heart? Where are they coming from? I only came up with two. And the first one is lack of connection with Jesus. And friends, if you're not connected with Jesus, nothing will happen. I am the vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man or a woman remain in me and I in them, they will bear much fruit. Let's all say the last part together. Apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. There was a group of 80 people who decided to form a new church. 
So one day, they had a wonderful brunch on a Sunday morning. They had a business meeting, and they decided to form this a new church. There were some wealthy people who gave very generously to this project, and they decided to build a building that will seat 600 people, minimum. And this group of people grew from 80 to 100, 120, and reached 140. And the church was halfway done. And they came to decide how many sets of pews they were going to have in that church. Now notice here we have two sets. Two on this side and two on this side. That church was bigger than this one, so they said we're going to go with a three and three, two and two. And this eventually erupted in a major fight. And it got so bad, the membership and the attendance started to go down. And the attendance went from 140, 120, 100. And finally, it leveled at 40. And it stayed at 40 for a whole year. And they came and asked me to be the pastor of this church. I thought about it. I prayed about it. And then I agreed to be the pastor of this church. I said, I'm going to go and help that church to grow And I will become a church growth expert. So I went to this church and I worked as hard as I could. I worked 80 hours. I brought everything I learned at the seminary and implemented at this church. I went to seminars. I came up with techniques, strategies, ideas. I even got my wife to work 20, 30 hours with me. And we did this for three and a half years. And I'm very happy to tell you the amazing result. After three and a half years, working as hard as we could, the attendance of that church went from 40 to 30. (laughs) And I became known as a church decline expert. If you are a church decline expert, nobody wants you. Nobody will ever hire you. See, I learned about all of these wonderful techniques and strategies. But the most important thing was the lesson that I did not learn. The first lesson we need to learn is the lesson of dependence upon God. That is the hardest lesson, especially in our culture here. It's all about individualism. But God wants us to depend on Him. Before we can attain success, whether you are an elder, deacon, Sabbath school teacher, a leader in a children division, we must accept the truth contained in the words of Christ. Without me, you can do nothing. That's really the greatest need for us today. Not books or strategies, but being on our knees, connecting with God. Let nothing What will be nothing? Television, phones. I read about a month ago a new survey saying that about 65% of men would rather give up their wives than their smartphones. What kind of men do we have today? Of course, none of them here is in this auditorium. But let nothing, however dear, however loved, observe your mind and affections, diverting you from the study of God's word or from earnest prayer. Watch unto prayer. 
earnest prayer. This is repeated 1,153 times. Earnest prayer. Too much reliance. That's the first the first root of our problem is lack of connection. The second one is too much reliance on human efforts. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Um, the word might is every conceivable human ingenuity, resources, talents, and say, not by any of these things, God's work is going to be done. I remember when my church dropped from 40 to 30, I was very, very discouraged and very angry. So I was stand in front of them, and I used to say, if I have a better congregation, I would have finished the work. They looked back at me, and they said, if we have a better pastor, we would have finished the work. And we kept blaming each other. It's not by what we do, but by the power of God. I want you to remember this. It's God who could do that. It's only the Spirit of God that can revive us. It's like the dead bone of Israel of all time. Um, the reason why we accomplish so little is that we do not walk with God. He's a day's journey for most of us. What is God's solution? Let's look at Acts 1.8. Go with me to this wonderful verse. Acts 1.8. And I'm reading from the new King James. But you shall receive power when? When the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. It's amazing to me, and I did this study. I went through the whole book of Acts. I read it several times from beginning to end. And I discover in those 28 chapters, there is 103 references to prayer. But here is the other amazing thing. There is 109 references to power. So that means in every chapter, three times, God is saying, I want you to pray. And three times, he's promising us that if we pray, we're going to have power. Power to overcome sin, power to live the wonderful Christian life, power to do ministry, power to do evangelism. You're going to be filled with power. You're going to be filled with joy, with grace, because the Holy Spirit will fill your life. You could see the manifestation of this power in this book. The disciples, for instance, they deny Jesus, they abandon him, they run away from him. But when this power came upon them, they turned the world upside down. They became fearless. And they went all over the world testifying to the power of the resurrection. That's what the Holy Spirit can do for us. I love this uh, quotation I want to read for you. The Lord is willing to do great things for us. I love this. God doesn't want to do little things for us. But for you, for your family, for your church, for your children, God wants to do great things. We shall not gain the victory through numbers, but through the full surrender of the soul to Jesus. We are to go forward in his strength, trusting in the mighty God of Israel. 
The context of this is the story of Gideon. Now let's recall the story. 135,000 of the Madianites came to destroy Israel. And Gideon was the leader. And uh, he wanted an army to go and find 132,000 people. What was the size of the army that he was able to muster? Does anybody remember? No, no. No, no, before that, what was the first figure? 30,000. 30,000. Of course, God said, that's too many. But let's look at the ratio. For 130 to 30, what is that ratio? One to four. And then it dropped from 30,000 to what? What is the next figure? No, no, before the 300. 10,000. So what is the ratio now? One to 13. Now remember, at that time, they did not have smart missiles. I don't know what that means, but they didn't have it. They did not have airplanes. They did not have nuclear bombs. Wars were one man against another man. So if you have 130,000, you need an army of 140, 50,000 in order to ensure victory. God said, I don't want 10,000. That's too many. Because if they win, they might take some credit for it. So we dropped it to what? What was the last figure? 300. Okay, what is the ratio now? Do we have any mathematician or engineer here? Well, I did the math for you. 411. You are outnumbered 400 times. You think there is no way I could win. The devil could be against you. All of these forces could be against the church. 400 times. But God gave them the victory. And the same God will give you the victory today. He's a wonderful God who said he's going to do great things for us. I love this. Workers for Christ, and that really includes all of us, are never to think, much speak, much less, much less speak of failure in their work. Why? We're never to speak failure because the Lord Jesus is our efficiency in all things. His Spirit is to be our inspiration. As we place ourselves in His hands, our means of doing good will never be exhausted. We may rely upon His grace and receive of His wisdom, which has no limit. I love this. Workers for Christ are never to think, much less speak of failure in their work. The Lord Jesus is our efficiency in all things. And Wesley said, God can do more with one person who is 100% committed to him than a whole army of men and women who are 99% committed to him. You know, when I accept an invitation to go anywhere, I start praying for the people. I don't know you, but God does. A friend of mine for the last several weeks, around noontime, we have been walking and lifting you up to the Lord in a prayer. And one of the things we prayed about is that we will all be filled with the Holy Spirit and that we will have the desire to connect with God always. The essence of revival. Um, The number one text in the whole Bible about revival is 2 Chronicles 7.14. To my surprise, 
I discover there's 160 plus books written on this just at the library at the university where I teach. Amazing. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear their land. So tell me, what are the conditions of revivals according to this text? Humble. Humble really is kicking arrogancy out of you. It's like you kick a football or a soccer ball. You kick arrogancy out of you. But before that, there are a few more before that. Pray. Uh, before that. The first one is if my people, you have to be adopted by God, who are called by my name, you have to call on him, humble yourself, pray, seek my face, experience God's presence, turn from your wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear their land. That's what it's really it's all about. It's about a relationship with God. It's about commitment. Um, here it is. We belong to God and are his people. We call on his name. We humble ourselves. We pray and seek him. We repent of our sin. And then God will hear our cries, will answer our prayers, and will renew us. We don't have time to read 160 books, but we have time to do this. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all of our needs. To seek this should be our first work. But it's our work by confession, humiliation, repentance, and earnest prayer. The same as we read in the text. To fulfill the conditions upon which God has promised to grant us his blessing. A revival need be expected only in answer to prayer. Okay. I'm just going to tell you what happened to me. When my church dropped from 40 to 30, I decided to quit. I used to be an engineer. I said, I'm going to go back again to engineering. I will make more money. I will have my evenings, my weekends off, and I will never have to deal with difficult people. So I went to my computer, and I typed my letter of resignation. I said, that's it. It's over. But somehow, somebody knocked on the door. So I went to open the door to see who it was. And at that time, we only had one computer. And my wife needed to use it. So she came to use the computer. And she saw my letter of resignation. And she came to me after she read it. And she asked me, why do I want to quit? I said to her, that's very, very simple. I have calculated that if the trend will continue the way it is, in a three and a half years from today, there will be just you and I in the church. <laughs> and I didn't want that to happen. I really wanted an honorable exit, as honorable as it could be. She looked at me and she said, have you been praying enough? I thought she was judgmental. <laughs> not that I was not praying, I was, but not with a passion and earnestness. So I started to argue with her. And finally, I lost the argument because deep inside of my heart, I knew I wasn't really praying with earnestness. So we came up with a plan. More accurately, she came up with a plan. <laughs> but we both decided to do it. And the plan was very simple. We're going to devote all day Monday to prayer and fasting. And we're going to see what God is going to do. We ate our last meal on Sunday night. 
And we're going to eat the next meal on Monday night. And on Monday morning, I decided to go to the church to pray. And she decided to stay at home with the kids and to pray. When I was leaving, she said, I would like you to pray like your life depends on it. I said, I don't know what that means, but I will do my best. So I went to the church, a huge church, bigger than this. Maybe one third, one half bigger than this. And as you know, all of you, or most of you, sit in the same spot every week, or close to it. So I came to where my friends over here are sitting, and I knelt down to pray for them. And two minutes later, I went to sleep. And I never sleep during the day, never. I mean, today I woke up at 1.30 in the morning and I couldn't sleep in the afternoon. But that day I slept eight hours. I felt refreshed at the end of the day. I felt really great. I got in my car to go home and it dawned on me, what am I going to tell my wife? (laughs) She greeted me at the door. She said, how was it? I said, it was great. And in my heart, I said, for the two minutes that it lasted. Well, I went back again the following week. And I went from two minutes to three minutes. And I went back again the following week. And I went to four minutes. And then I went back again the following week. And it was down to two minutes again. And I made a significant discovery. I'm just not wired to do this. It was hard for me to sit at the feet of Jesus. It was a lot easier for me to have a plan or strategy or techniques. But sitting at the feet of Jesus was hard. We have a story in the Bible of two sisters, Mary and Martha. Who is the hero of that story? Mary, but I want to tell you a secret. Every pastor and every church are deeply in love with Martha. Because nothing will happen in your church or any church without the Marthas of this world. She is the first one to volunteer to do vacation Bible school or potluck or to visit somebody in the hospital. But doing ministry without sitting at the feet of Jesus will result in anger and resentment and will be fruitless ministry. Whatever you do, my friends, sit at the feet of Jesus. Who turned to Martha and said, Martha, you worry about too many things. Only one thing is needed. Just one thing. And that is to sit at the feet of Jesus. Well, with the encouragement of my wife, I kept going back to the church to learn to sit at the feet of Jesus. One day I said to her, I'm going to do this, even if it will kill me. But it didn't kill me. Because after a while, God got hold of my heart and changed me. And for the first time, I started to practice the presence of God in my life. I was a pastor at that moment for approximately 11 years. But nobody taught me about these things. I have to learn them all on my own. I I started to feel a completely different person. I started to have hope. Nothing changed in the church, but just inside of me. I started to feel that God has wonderful a plan for my life and the life of my church. I started to feel significance to my life. I started to feel power. I really enjoyed God's presence so much. I expanded that time with God from Monday to every day of the week. And I started to go for prayer walks, which I have been doing 
ever since. And I enjoy them. And I take a lot of my students with me for prayer walks. Oh, we love it. And by the way, I want to encourage all of you to go for a prayer walks. It's not the same as a prayer drive or a prayer cooking because here you get the exercise, you get the sunshine, you get the air. And above all, and most importantly, you get the communion with the Heavenly Father. I did this for about 11 months. And one day, I came to preach. And I looked at the congregation. And that particular Sabbath, there were my faithful 30 people, plus four more. Right here in the front, there was a husband and a wife. They looked like in their late 20s, early 30s, with two little girls. Our church never had any visitors. Never. In fact, our church was so depressing, I wouldn't have gone myself if I was not required to be there. So I looked at this couple and I said, they probably are passing by our town or they have relatives in our town and they came to visit with them and they decided to come and worship with us. I preached my sermon. I went to the door to greet the people and they were the last people to come. And uh, I looked at the man and I said to him, why are you in my church? Now, if, if you want a hint from me, that's not a good way to greet visitors. Before he answered... I answered for him. I said, you must have some relatives in our area. He said, no. We live across the street. And he pointed to a house behind me. He said, that's my house. Well, now I became interested in the story. I said, so why are you here? He said he was fishing in Alaska. And his boss was an ex-Adventist. And this boss gathered the crew every night and shared with them his philosophy of life. Different topics every night. One night, the topic was going to church. The man I met that day never had been to church. Never. Not once in his life, not for a funeral or a wedding. But he was sitting there politely listening to his boss. He didn't care. He finished his fishing, came back home. And uh, one day, his wife said to him, I feel the need for God. I used to go to the Catholic church when I was a little girl. I enjoyed it. I like to go back again to the Catholic church. He looked at her and he said, absolutely not. My boss said, if you go to church, you have to go to the Seventh-day Adventist church. She said, I don't care as long as it is a church. So they started to come to my church. And a few months later, I had the privilege of baptizing them. And I'd like you to picture what happened that day. After the baptism, I brought this couple to the front. And the man was standing here, and his wife was next to him. And I stood next to her. And I attempted to tell their story of how they came to know Jesus and how they came to the church. Two, three minutes into telling their story, I drifted into telling my story. And I told the congregation about my struggle with the prayer. And how I used to come to the church to try to pray and go to sleep. 
And then I said this. I said, this church of God for four years without any baptism. And that broke my heart. So I said, I started to pray that God this year will give me one baptism. And then I said this, but the God of the whole universe was listening to the prayers of a discouraged pastor in the middle of nowhere, in the state of Washington. And he gave me this couple. And really what hit me at that moment was the fact that God was listening to me. Friends, I want to tell you, every one of you here, every one of you, is one out of Seven billion people on the planet Earth. That's a lot of people. But the minute you come to Jesus, He will drop everything and you will become the object of His attention. Just come to Jesus. And you will have an audience of one-to-one with him. I'm standing in front of 34 people that day. And, And this thought is just dawning on me. So I repeated myself again and I said, The God of the whole universe... Loved me enough. Cared about me enough. To listen to me. And give me this couple. Now I started to cry. Just like right now. I just couldn't believe it. That we have such a wonderful. And a great and awesome God. That values every one of us. Every one of us. And will listen to us. And will care about us. And will answer our prayers. And then I was really caught up in the wonder of God. And I said it the third time. I said, the God of the whole universe is with me. Listening to me. Cares about me. Loves me. And when I said this. A man from the back of the church. 71 year old man. Walked to the front. And he started to cry. He just broke down. He looked at me and he just was bawling out. He said, I have five children. When they were young, they used to come to church. But not one of them today take God seriously. But if God listened to the prayers of Pastor Joe, I know he's going to listen to my prayers too. I am going to pray and pray some more and pray again. Till God gives me my five children. You know, God showed up that day in a very powerful way. And then this man turned to the church. He took the Bible. And he went to Matthew chapter 21 verse 13. And he said to them, it's written... My house shall be called the house of prayer. He said, I know all of you. Many of you have children who are outside of the Lord. 
Jesus is calling us to turn this place into a house of prayer. I want you to come to the front and join me in praying for our children, our community, ourselves. And let's make this place into a house of prayer. Then he said, I know all of you. All of you have children or relatives who are outside of the Lord. And he said, we need to get together and ask God to intervene. And a woman from that side of the church stood up and came to the front. She looked at me first and she said, I have three children. They all are married. They all have kids. But now one of them take God seriously. They all did when they were young, but not today. But if God answered your prayers, I know you could answer my prayers too. And then she looked at Dave and she said, Dave, I want to join you in turning this place into a house of prayer. Ten people that day came to the front. And that started a movement of prayer in that church. We started to meet on Sunday morning to pray. Monday noon, every day of the week. On Sabbath, we met before Sabbath school, during Sabbath school, during church, after church, to pray. The first thing that happened was a spirit of love and grace and harmony came to that church. All of those pity differences we had just disappeared. They were insignificant. And just God was just doing marvelous things in the life of that congregation. Amazing things. The Lord is willing to do great things for us. Eight and a half years later, that group of 30 people it grew to more than 600 people. The place was jam-packed. And they planted another church that grew to about 200 people. And to God be the glory. When I tried to help that church to grow, I killed it. But when we prayed, two amazing things happened. We were changed. And the church became a force to impact the community. We can't impact anybody unless we ourselves are connected with the Heavenly Father. What happened to that man that interrupted me? I never finished that sermon. How many of you have children who are outside of the Lord? Let me see your hands. Look at them. Uh, keep your hands up, please. Let's add how many of you have brothers or sisters who are outside of the Lord? Mo mother or father. Uh, friends. Every hand will go up. Well, I have good news for you. I have encouraging news. God honored the prayers of that man. All of his children came back to the Lord. It was a miracle, but the Lord is willing to do great things. All of this happened in a small community of 16,000 people in the middle of Washington State where there are more cherry trees than there are people. But our God is an amazing God, is a powerful God who could do the impossible. A few years ago, my friend David stood in a front of 30 people. And he read the text. It's written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And then he said to the congregation, if it is your desire to turn this place into a house of prayer, I'd like you to come to the front. Today, I extend the same invitation to you. If it is your desire to turn yourself into a house of prayer, if 
It is your desire to turn your home into a house of prayer. If it is your desire to turn your church into a house of prayer, I'd just like you to come to the front. And let's pray. Let's be the beginning of a wonderful year of walking with Jesus, of connecting with Jesus. As you come to the front, I just like you, every few people, to get together and pray about three things. I'd like you to pray first that God will give you hunger and desire for Him, that God will build up your spirituality. And the other thing, I'd like you to pray that God will bring a revival to you and the people around you and to your church. And thirdly, if there is somebody in your life who needs to know Jesus, lift them up to the Lord today. So every few people just get together and pray with each other.